I wish to focus on Mr. Thiago's contribution in establishing the Urban Development Corporation, the Downtown Development Plan, the development of Kingston General, and of course, the development of the town of Ocho Rios. The highway, which spans several administrations, links the two economic centers, Kingston and Ocho Rios. It is therefore symbolically appropriate to accord Mr. Siaga this honor of naming the highway which links two significant bodies of his work. In this triennium period, one of the most significant decisions taken is the recommendation to approve an expenditure of $2 million over the remaining period of this triennium to build up the university presence in the non-campus territories. From the time he started the Heart Trust, which spoke to an alternative or parallel, you know, developmental path for our youths, it began to speak to the understanding that education and training in its broadest context were needed for the forward march of this country. established most of the cultural institutions in this country. Uh, I remember very much the fact that he conceptualized the Edna Manley Center. Um, at that time it was not called the Edna Manley but the Cultural Training Center and he also conceptualized the CPTC where he felt that it, is, it was important to capture the, the, the culture of the people and to document those things. I had a first-hand first -hand experience of Jamaican folk music mm -hmm. and the, the religious music as well, the Bible, and Kumina and things like that. And of course, that to me was the heart and soul of the Jamaican folk culture. I think the landmark development in terms of managing the built environment, the development of the built environment would be the role he played in the UDC, uh, which then laid the platform and the plans for much of the urban development of Jamaica. Quite a bit of effort was placed in the development of the Kingston waterfront. As a nation builder, all his life, that man has demonstrated that he believes in the building of a nation. That's his passion. During the course of his life, Edward Siaga made a profound impact on contemporary Jamaica. This multifaceted, multi-talented pragmatist had established various institutions in the tourism, cultural, political, and financial sectors. The Urban Development Corporation, UDC, Jamaica Stock Exchange, and Jamaica Unit Trust were also established by Edward Siaga. He also sought the creation of the Jamaica Mortgage Bank, Students' Loan Bureau, National Development Bank, Agricultural Credit Bank, Jamaica National Investment Promotion Limited, now Jampro, 
and the eggs in back. Putting Jamaica back on track in the 1980s would have been the most pleasing. I wish to focus on Mr. Siaga's contribution in establishing the Urban Development Corporation, the downtown development plans, the development of Kingston General, and of course, the development of the town of Ocho Rios. The highway, which spans several administrations, links the two economic centers, Kingston and Ocho Rios. It is therefore symbolically appropriate to accord Mr. Siaga this honor of naming the highway which links two significant bodies of his work. In this triennium period, one of the most significant decisions taken is the recommendation to approve an expenditure of $2 million over the remaining period of this triennium to build up the university presence in the non-campus territories. From the time he started, the Heart Trust, which spoke to an alternative or parallel, you know, developmental path for our youths, it began to speak to the understanding that education and training in its broadest context were needed for the forward march of this country. most of the cultural institutions in this country. Uh, I remember very much the fact that he conceptualized the Edna Manley Center. Um, at that time, it was not called the Edna Manley, but the Cultural Training Center. And he also conceptualized the CPTC, where he felt that it, is, it was important to capture the, the, the culture of the people and to document those things. I had a first-hand first -hand experience of Jamaican folk music mm -hmm. and the, the religious music as well, revival, and coming and things like that. And of course, that to me was the heart and soul of the old Jamaican culture. I think the landmark development 
in terms of managing the built environment, the development of the built environment would be the role he played in the UDC, uh, which then laid the platform and the plans for much of the urban development of Jamaica. Quite a bit of effort was placed in the development of the Kingston waterfront. He's a nation builder. All his life, that man has demonstrated that he believes in the building of a nation. That's his passion. During the course of his life, Edward Siaga made a profound impact on contemporary Jamaica. This multifaceted, multi-talented pragmatist had established various institutions in the tourism, cultural, political, and financial sectors. The Urban Development Corporation, UDC, Jamaica Stock Exchange, and Jamaica Unit Trust were also established by Edward Siaga. He also sought the creation of the Jamaica Mortgage Bank, Students' Loan Bureau, National Development Bank, Agricultural Credit Bank, Jamaica National Investment Promotion Limited, now Jampro, and the Exim Bank. Putting Jamaica back on track in the 1980s would have been the most pleasing. Ladies and gentlemen, our media practitioners, we want you to know that the Honorable Prime Minister is on property. And so we're asking everyone to settle down for his arrival. And when he arrives, we will stand. I will indicate when we do that. Ladies and gentlemen, at this time we're asking you to stand for the arrival of the most honorable Andrew Holness, Prime Minister of Jamaica. Thank you, you can keep the applause going. And we're welcoming to the podium our Honorable Prime Minister, or Honorable Favel Williams, Minister of Education and Youth, and Professor the Honorable Alvin Wint, Chairman of the Board of Directors. And we will keep standing, we will keep standing at this time for the playing of the National Anthem.
may be seated. The most honorable Andrew Holness, Order of the Nation, Member of the Privy Council, Member of Parliament, and Prime Minister. Honorable Favor Williams, Member of Parliament and Minister of Education. Professor the Honorable Alvin Wint, OJ, CD, Chairman of the Board of Directors. Senator the Honorable Thomas Tavares Finson, President of the Senate. Members of the Houses of Parliament, Professor Colin Giles, President and Faculty and, of, and Staff of the UTEC, Heads of Public and Private Bodies, Representatives of Academia, Staff Members of the Heart NSTA Trust, Students, Trainees, Media Representatives, Ladies and Gentlemen, Good evening. It is with great pleasure that I welcome you to this the inaugural Human Development Lecture on the life and legacy of the founder of the illustrious Human Employment and Resource Training Trust, HART, the most honorable Edward Philip Judge Siag. As a managing director of this formidable organization, I feel extremely privileged to be afforded the opportunity to exercise stewardship and leadership over an organization that has been interwoven into the fabric of Jamaica and has been making monumental contributions to human development and nation building for not one, not two, not three, but all of four decades. Now, as we celebrate the Trust's 40th anniversary, November 4, 2022, I invite you to pause for a moment of silence in honor of the most honorable Edward Philip George Siaga, founder of the Heart NSTA Trust. May his soul rest in peace. Thank you. The Human Employment and Resource Training Heart Trust was established in 1982 in a milieu of significant stress for the Jamaica labor market. Industries and businesses were still reeling from the effects of the severe brain drain that resulted from the migration of over 270,000 Jamaicans between 1971 and 1980, which accounted for the loss of as much as 50% of the Jamaican middle class, according to the Encyclopedia of Nations. Employers were hard pressed to find skilled, competent workers, while many school leavers, though academically qualified, were not able to find employment. In 1982, national surveys indicated that there were 80,000 young people between the ages of 17 and 20 who were neither in schools nor in jobs. Hart, the brainchild of former Prime Minister Edward Siaga, was a remarkable response to address a massive manpower problem for the productive sector while opening access to skills training and employment for 10,000s of young people. In 1982, the trust commenced skills training, and by January 1984, its successes resulted in the opening of Hart's first academy, the Stony Hill Hart Academy. Over the years, we would have seen the burgeoning of the reach and the impact of the trust. Today, the trust boasts 26 wholly operated institutions and over 80 community training interventions, 
The trust also boasts over a hundred and ten percent increase in graduates since its inception. That is from 4,051 in 1982 to 46,473 in 2022. That ladies, yes, a round of applause, indeed, thank you. That ladies and gentlemen is indeed an achievement worthy of celebration. In volume two of his book about his life and leadership, published in 2010, the most honorable Edward Siaga expressed his special affinity for heart. He chronicled that among the large number of institutions that he had been responsible for creating, heart was one of his favorites, owing to the fact, and I quote, it has saved thousands of wasted youth by giving them a second opportunity to create a better life. And this, he said, gave him great personal satisfaction that he played a role in bettering their lives. Ladies and gentlemen, as I reflect on the Trust's long history, I too share the sentiments of the most honorable Edward Siaga. The Trust has over the past four decades indeed provided various avenues for Jamaicans to live productive lives. We operate in a dynamic environment and as such, the Trust must be agile in addressing the shifting demands of industry and the emerging areas of economic and social development. In this stead, our strategic focus includes training and certifying Jamaicans in emerging skills and strengthening our partnerships, youth development, lifelong and digital literacy and the facilitation of decent work. So today, as we honor and reflect on the life and the legacy of the most honorable Edward Siaga, I encourage you to consider how his passionate mission to provide a meaningful future for those who had fallen outside of the formal education system has blossomed into something much greater today. Whilst the organization still has a strong focus on Jamaica's youth and particularly unattached and at-risk youth, our programs, our products, and our services are geared towards ensuring that no one is left behind. The Trust salutes the former Prime Minister of Jamaica, whose creation of heart has caused an enduring legacy to the nation. I thank you. Could we have a round of applause for the life and the work of the most honorable Edward Philip George Siaga. And at this time, I invite to bring greetings Professor the Honorable Alvin Wint, OJ, CD, and the Chairman of the Board of Directors for the Heart NSTA Trust. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ingleton. The most honorable Andrew Michael Onis, Prime Minister of Jamaica. Honorable Favor Williams, Minister of Education and Youth. Senator the Honorable Thomas Tavares Finson, President of the Senate and longtime member of the Electoral Commission of Jamaica. Member of the Houses of Parliament, Professor Colin Giles, President of UTEC and faculty members and staff of UTEC. And I'd also like to welcome um, heads of private sector bodies, public sector bodies, representatives of academia, staff members of the Heart Trust, students, the media, and ladies and gentlemen. It is such a pleasure to be here this evening and to bring greetings. I'm gonna ask your indulgence though because my greetings have a theme, an interconnected theme of intergener intergenerationality and policy in action. And maybe greetings aren't supposed to have themes but I crave your indulgence. 
Around the turn of the century, that is the last century, the 19th moving into the 20th century, Mr. and Mrs. Vysotsky left Russia and landed in New York as Jews, Russian Jews. They had a son in, in 1913 called Raymond Vysotsky. And Raymond turned out to be a star. He and his siblings changed the family name to Vernon. He graduated with a PhD from Columbia University in 1941. And then just at the time when the US was this unipolar agent in the world, he began working with the State Department and became a star at the State Department. He helped implement the Marshall Plan for Europe, which was America's response to the challenge of Europe after the Second World War. He helped to establish the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, which became the World Trade Organization. After the Second World War, he was a key member of the State Department team that went to Japan and began the redevelopment of Japan in the context of the drafting of a new constitution. After he served spectacularly at the State Department, he went to Harvard University and became a professor and essentially became the father of the scholarly field of international business and some describe him as the father of globalization. In the late 1960s, after his visit to Jamaica where he became concerned that the Jamaican model of development was not the right model for Singapore, Lee Kuan Yew went on a short visit to Harvard, a sabbatical he called it, and he held discussions with Ray Vernon. And Ray Vernon helped him to understand the potential for attracting investment in Singapore. He had not contemplated that that would be possible. He states in his biography later on that he would periodically go back to Harvard to have discussions with Raymond Vernon. The rest, as we know, is history. In 1985, Ray Vernon said to a small group of graduate students in his final class to them that I'm going to give you the secret to success. And the first element in that secret is you should choose your parents wisely. Vernon was the son of a truck driver. He used to carry bottled water to the hotels in New York. He had performed spectacularly well. And yet here he was essentially saying that he is standing on the shoulders of those who have gone before. That is so important for us today as we celebrate the 40th anniversary of the Heart Trust. We are standing on the shoulders. And we have some outstanding political leaders in Jamaica. One of them is sitting right behind me. His uh, political adversary at this point in time is Mark Golden, whose father was Professor Sir John Golden, who was so concerned about policy in action that he was central to the policy response to Jamaica's polio epidemic. The father of Prime Minister Andrew Honis is not as well known as Professor Sir John Golden, but he has been just as impactful. In the early 1970s, Maurice Honis was a teacher at the St. Elizabeth Technical High School. He was the form teacher for a class called 9H. 9-H was a class of students who had passed the grade 9 achievement test at age 15 and got their second chance 
had a secondary education. They were very grateful because prior to passing, many were contemplating that their educational tenure would finish at age 15. Maurice Honis instilled in these individuals confidence. He was passionate about his subject. He taught agricultural science. And he believed in the interaction between policy and action. So not only was he a policy teacher of agricultural science, but he had a farm. And my understanding, Prime Minister, is that you would visit that farm on, on, on your summer vacation and become grounded in the discipline and the practices and I'm sure there will be tremendous conversation between you and your father. You stand on his shoulders. But Prime Minister, so too do some people in this audience. And my wife, Maisie Wint, she was sins at the time. Uh, we both were in that 9 age class. And we too stand on the shoulders of Maurice Onis. <laughs> Prime Minister, I think we both would like you to convey to him our deepest appreciation for the confidence in which he instilled in us. The individual that we celebrate today stands on shoulders also. Managing Director indicated that his name is Edward Philip George Siaga. His grandfather's name was George Siaga. His father's name was Philip George Siaga. He became Edward Philip George Siaga. Literally standing on the shoulders, but I'm sure he would also have benefited so much from parental guidance. But he was also a master of policy in action. And I give you just two examples. There will be so many anecdotes. In 1987, a researcher who was working for the World Bank, came to Jamaica to study privatization. And he was interviewing uh, companies uh, and public sector individuals in the area of privatization. He got a telephone call. The Prime Minister would like to speak with you. He was shocked. When researchers go to countries to conduct studies, they don't expect a call saying the Prime Minister would like to speak to you. But that was the nature of Edward Siaga. Fifteen years later, an academic at UWI uh, wrote a book on competitiveness in small developing economies, and he sent the book to the then Prime Minister Patterson and to then leader of the opposition, Edward Siaga. And Prime Minister Patterson wrote him a lovely, gracious letter indicating that the contents of the book reflected uh, the direction of government policy. Edward Siaga called the academic and said, I'd like to meet with you. And he spent hours talking with him about the contents of the book that he had marked up in detail and was especially interested in issues in relation to exchange policy management. A man interested in policy, he later went on to use some of that information as he made his final presentation to Parliament before his retirement. This is the nature of the man whom we celebrate today. Hart stands on his shoulders as he has stood on the shoulders of others and our outstanding politicians have stood on the shoulders of their parents. Generations of staff members of Hart have also stood on the shoulders of prior generations and we appreciate that. Managing Director, I, I couldn't help but note that when we looked at your application, and Dr. Ingleton has been with us just since August, but it seems like a much longer time, one of your referees was Robert Winter. And, and Robert, of course, is a, a well-known uh, individual who has done so much in terms of the leadership of art. So, ladies and gentlemen, this is why it gives me so much pleasure today at the 40th anniversary of the Heart NSTA Trust to honor those shoulders and the policy action on which today we stand. I thank you. Thank you so much.
Professor the Honorable Alvin Wint, our chairman. Indeed, we are inspired and we understand how important it is for us to know where we're coming from and to know that the work that we have been doing, we have been indeed standing on the shoulders of giants. I want to take this opportunity to welcome the Honorable Alanda Terrellong, State Minister in the Ministry of Culture, Gender, Entertainment and Sport. Welcome. And at this time, yes please, thank you. We're going to be hearing from Honorable Favel Williams, Member of Parliament and Minister of Education and Youth. And I want to say to the audience that if you see Honorable Williams slipping out a little while before we end, it's because she has another critical engagement at the Ministry of Education, um, the retirement banquet um, that they're having at the Pegasus Hotel today. So please forgive her and welcome her at this time. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. I can barely hear you though. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Let me acknowledge Prime Minister, the most honorable Andrew Holness, Honorable Alanda Terrellon, Senator, the Honorable Tom Tavares Vincent, President of the Senate, Senator Rodriguez, Professor Giles, President, acting at UTech, faculty and staff, students here at UTech as well, Professor Alvin Wint, Chairman of Heart NSDA Trust. Dr. Tanisha Ingleton, Managing Director of the Heart NSDA Trust. Distinguished guests, good afternoon. It is my pleasure to bring you greetings at this occasion celebrating the 40th anniversary of this world-class institution. As we all know, former Prime Minister Edward Siaga seeded a vision when he established the Heart NSDA Trust. And as Minister of Education, I remain committed to seeing that vision through alongside the Prime Minister of Jamaica. Heart, as you know, first came into being at an inaugural meeting on July 23rd, 1982. Over the years, it has had a long list of contributors and stakeholders who enacted and sustained the vision, making Heart NSTA what it is today. From the days of calling it Heart Academy, when the trainees boarded and the cohort was mostly male, to the newly revamped Heart NSTA that embraces digital certification, engages students in a wide range of disciplines and graduates almost an equal cohort of men and women each year. This institution has my utmost respect and admiration. No doubt, yes, no doubt the employees, the facilitators, the administrators and support staff are the best of what Jamaica has to offer. The Heart Trust NTA now boasts 28 heart institutions, over 80 community training intervention program, numerous nationwide partnerships and special projects in various sectors. I know that the programs cover hospitality, wellness and beauty services, construction services, automotive services, creative arts, agriculture, and ecological sciences, information and communication technology. And I know this because as an MP, we see many young people who come to us looking for opportunities. And one of my first questions to those young people is, have you ever gone to heart to see what they have to offer? Are you trained in any of their programs? And to the extent that their answer is no, but they want to do so, as member of parliament, we always seek to help them out. And I know I see um, the Honorable Alondo just nodding, because that's what we do. 
on a daily, almost a daily basis. We encourage the young people to take advantage of all the programs that are offered at HEART. So this, tell, this should tell you, and I'm sure you know, that HEART and STA is fully engaged in the human development, and that will help Jamaica to chart a course into the future. Your theme, fortified for nation building, rings true. And Jamaica as a nation is made better by your invaluable contribution. Let me use this opportunity to wish the institution well as you continue to undertake the various activities in pursuit of upholding the pillars of human development in our country. Congratulations on 40 years. Thank you. Thank you so much, Honorable Minister. Indeed, we are grateful for the support of the Ministry of Education and Youth, and we continue to benefit from the passionate employees that they have there, and of course, from the vision of our Honorable Minister of Education. Ladies and gentlemen, it is indeed my pleasure at this time to welcome to the podium the Most Honorable Andrew Michael Holness, Prime Minister of Jamaica, who is steadfastly focused on building partnerships to achieve the vision of shared prosperity for all Jamaicans through inclusive economic growth and meaningful job creation. Our Prime Minister has brought national attention and focused the literacy and has instituted several programs to place Jamaica on the path to universal literacy. Leading an agile and responsive government, the Prime Minister is committed to making Jamaica the place of choice to live, to work, to raise families, to do business, and to retire in paradise. Ladies and gentlemen, the Prime Minister needs no further introduction. Could we stand and welcome our beloved Prime Minister of Jamaica, the most honorable Andrew Michael Holness. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ingleton, for that rousing introduction. It is uh, my great pleasure to address this event today, and I want to start off by thanking the board and management of HEART for hosting this event. I think it is particularly important that we spend some time to reflect on our history, reflect on the people who have charted the course before us, and whose vision, whose effort, whose plans we now live in. They obviously shaped the times in which we now exist. To speak of the life and work of, and let me, I'm only going to say this once, Edward Philip George Siaga is challenging. Mr. Siaga touched almost every facet of Jamaican life in a positive way and in an impactful way. He was a legislator an anthropologist, an urban planner, I would stick in there an architect. He was a talent manager and music producer. He was a social reformer, a visionary and a dreamer, a politician and a statesman. And sometimes I, even, I, know, I held the view that he wanted to study law. He was an author. 
he was a hotelier, an art collector, a sports administrator, and a scholar. And I'm sure you're probably saying he left something off. Because you, you have an, an, a profession that I forgot for him. I saw you raising your hand. The Most Honorable Edward Philip George Siaga was born on May 28, uh, 1930. There is some connection, Professor Wynn, because you, the current executive director of the Heart Trust, Dr. Ingleton, shares a birthday with Mr. Siaga. Of course, I won't say when her birth year was. You can guess. He was born to Philip George Siaga and Erna Siaga. His parents were Jamaicans, but they were on a trip to Boston, Massachusetts, in the United States. And as fate would have it, Mr. Siaga was born in Boston. He came home to Jamaica as a seven-month-old infant and he got baptized in the Kingston Parish Church in December 1930. Of course, in later life, he would give up his U.S. citizenship because this is where his heart and his life was. After early schooling in Montego Bay, Edward Siaga became a Kingstonian and attended Woolmer's Boys. At Woolmer's, he excelled not only in his scholastic endeavors, but believe it or not, he was a cricketer and did very well. He played tennis and hockey, and uh, he swam for the school. And in those days, rifle shooting was a sport, and he excelled at that as well. His educational development continued at the prestigious Harvard University in the United States. Uh, before that, he was a student at the University of the West Indies. My recollection is that uh, he was in the medical faculty. He went to Harvard and completed a degree in sociology and anthropology in 1952. Harvard was a critical part of the development of his global outlook. Mr. Siaga shared that when he went to Harvard, he had intentions of becoming a nuclear scientist. But it didn't capture his mind. Ha and he would later say, that he wanted to do something where his brain would immediately get things done. He didn't want to have to study in a laboratory, in a building somewhere. He wanted to get into the laboratory of life and to make a difference. So the story is told that on his return to Jamaica with his degree in sociology and anthropology, he went to live in a rural community called Boxon Town in St. Catherine. And he, he lived there. He lived with the people there. He went to church with them. He lived in the community, he helped the children, and then he would also take up residence in Salt Lane, in Kingston, living with the urban poor of Kingston. So he was really interested in taking the theoretical foundations of his studies and applying them in the laboratory of life. 
as we have heard, policy in action. So he knew much about rural and urban life in Jamaica. Not by reading, not by lectures, but by living. And I think we have to assess the man for this because, you know, how many Jamaicans would do that now? And the question is still relevant. How many Jamaicans did that then? But he thought it necessary. It wasn't a kind of condescending interrogation of life. I am this Harvard-trained student coming to research. He had a genuine care, love, and passion. He wanted to understand. And he took the time to document the cultural practices. He took the time to understand the people and their vibrations. And that would have been very impactful on him for the rest of his life. He ended up being drawn into politics before he could complete and fully pursue his academic studies. So, by 1959, our national hero, right excellent Sir Alexander Bustamante, found him, discovered him, laid hands on him, and appointed him to the Legislative Council. At that time, he would have been the youngest ever appointed to the Legislative Council at age 29. But he was already known. He was writing to the papers, talking about social conditions. So he came on the radar as a potential talent for leadership of the country. The Gleaner newspaper actually named him political man of the year when he was appointed to the Senate. And this was after his landmark speech, the haves and the have-nots. So if you reflect upon him going to live in Boxton Town and in Salt Lane, this quite well prepared him to put policy into action to document the circumstances of the people and bring it in a form of a debate in parliament and present it to the leaders of the country. That was Edward Seattle. He also became one of the framers of the Constitution meaning that he was a part of the group of parliamentarians who presided over the writing of the Constitution of Jamaica. In 1962, he would step into electoral politics. And uh, since that period of time, 1962, he would spend 45 years of his life in public service. Mr. Siago held various positions in government. He was Minister of Development and, and Welfare. He was Minister of Finance. And he was Jamaica's fifth Prime Minister and Minister of Finance at the same time. And of course, he also held the constitutional role of leader of the opposition. Mr. Siaga was an exemplary 
individual, a special individual. Uh, my personal experience with him uh, was instructive for me. Uh, I, I won't go into too much of his life and work, except to say that he had an exceptional work ethic. Uh, when I just started to work with Mr. Siaga, you know, he would come into the office at about nine, and he wouldn't leave there until 10 p.m. And uh, he was very disciplined. He would be thoroughly researched. Now, this was before computers were widely used. And when we had budget debates, and parliamentary presentations. I, I worked with him in his private business, but I also assisted him politically with research. And I recall having to get stacks of the social, the survey of social and economic conditions in Jamaica, uh, and stacks of other books. And uh, we would spend hours and hours going through the books looking at the figures, preparing tables. Uh, we had a conference room, a table, that was maybe the distance between these two speakers. And they were laid out with books and books and books. And we would go through them in detail. That's the, the nature of Mr. Siaga. He was a high-level thinker. He looked at the big picture. But I believe his strongest skills were that he paid attention to details. And I believe that would explain why he was able to implement so many of the policies that he envisioned. So he was ambidextrous in that way. He was able to envision the policy, reduce the policy to writing, support the policy with research, but he had also the management capability to get it done. Uh, not many leaders are so uh, consummate in this area, but Edward Siaga was one such consummate leader. Due to his vision and foresight, so many institutions were created. In 1967, the Jamaica Citizens Bank the first majority-owned uh, Jamaican commercial bank. In 1968, the Jamaica Stock Exchange. In 1971, the Unit Trust. In 72, the Jamaica Mortgage Bank, the National Development Bank. In 1981, the Agricultural Credit Bank. In 1986, the Exim Bank of Jamaica. In 1987, JAMPRO, then it was called JNIP, the Students' Loan Bureau. And in the cultural field, there were so many other institutions that he formed. The Jamaica Festival, the JCDC, which we call it now, the National Gallery, the Jamaica Cultural Training uh, Center for the Arts, the Craft Development Agency, Things Jamaica, the Arawak and Port Royal Museums. He created the UDC, which spawned the development of downtown Kingston and the town of Ocho Rios. And I could go on and on and on. Ladies and gentlemen, the institution that he loved the most, however, in my view, was the Heart Trust. Which he established on the 23rd of July, 1982. I believe he missed 
he took it forward a day because it really should have been the 22nd, but he expressed his feelings about Hart in volume two of his memoirs as pointed out by Dr. Ingleton. And let me give you his exact, the exact quote. He said, among the large number of institutions which I have been responsible for creating, Hart became one of my favorites because it saved thousands of youth by giving them a second opportunity to create a better life. It gave me, that is him, personal satisfaction that I played a role in bettering their lives. Hart was born out of the immediate concern that the education system was failing to turn out the human resources needed to support economic activity. But more than that, he was concerned about the loss of value in the untrained human resources of the country. So it's one thing that businesses don't have the labor that they need to drive growth, but it is also a concern that our young people will not have the opportunity to develop themselves, to fulfill their dreams and ambitions. He was very much concerned about that. And so he created heart. He reasoned, and this is, these are his thoughts, this is what he has said in his memoirs, the most critical problem of the secondary education system was that a great majority of students failed to graduate each year. In fact, only 25% were considered academically ready to sit school-leaving exams. Of this number, only somewhat half would pass enough subjects to graduate. The remainder would fall short in the number of passes required to obtain a certificate of graduation. This latter group of students that almost fulfill the requirement for matriculation was actually the second best human resource talent in the school system. The chun or misfortune, or to give them specifically targeted vocational training. We know what choice was made. The choice was made to create heart and not to leave our young people up to fortune or misfortune. So heart was the answer to Mr. Siaga's passionate mission to find a way to reduce unemployment, increase skills for the economy, but to increase the life chances of our young people, to give them a pathway to fulfill themselves. Heart would become the platform on which many other programs would be rolled out. One of them was called the Solidarity Program. I don't know how many of you recall that program or would be aware of that program. And what the Solidarity Program sought to do was having brought in these young, talented, but untrained Jamaicans, he would create a provision to give small loans. I believe the entity was called the Self Start Fund to these young trainees. And they would start up small businesses and he would pair them with a mentor from the private sector. 
And the mentor's duty would be to give business guidance, but also to ensure that the loan was repaid. These were just some of the creative things that happened from the HART program. Since then, HART has evolved. But as you reflect on what I have said, you would also be thinking that the problem that sparked the creation of HART still exists today. Our secondary school system is simply not turning out the students at the level of education that makes them trainable to get them to the next step of being employable. It doesn't mean that heart has failed. What it means is that heart is still relevant in today's circumstances. I know I have taken up too much of your time already, but I was told I was to give a lecture. But I'm reminded that it doesn't have to be um, uh, what, what they call it now, eternal, to be memorable. Now, so Hart was born out of the context of trying to, as I've said before, provide the necessary skills to support growth and to ensure that young people had an opportunity, a second chance to fulfill themselves. But, but I want you to also note the global context in which this institution was formed. Last Sunday, we marked the 42nd year, or the, is it the 40th year? 42nd year of the Jamaica Labour Party's victory in the 1980 election. The 1980s and the late 70s was a turbulent time in Jamaica's history. I, I'm not going to explore the political issues, but it was also a turbulent time in the world as well. Having taken over the government in less than a year, the new government led by Mr. Siago was faced with an unprecedented fallout in revenues from bauxite. Now at that time, our economy was not as diversified as it is now, and still our economy is not sufficiently diversified as we would want it. That wiped out more than 50% of revenues. It's the equivalent of the pandemic wiping out revenues from tourism and other uh, revenues generated from global trade and, uh, and global activities. It had such a devastating impact on the ability of the government to deliver basic services. But there was also another critical element that Mr. Siaga had to address. He inherited an economy that was not fit for purpose. Now, I want you to pay attention to this. I did not plan my presentation with, Doc, with Professor Wynn's presentation, but he made some points which sparked me to 
see if I could do what he attempted to do, make connections. And I will pass on to my dad that connection of St. Elizabeth Technical High. Now, Lee Kuan Yew visited Jamaica. I believe he visited Jamaica twice. He visited in the 60s and he, he visited in the 70s. And if you read his book, it is quite clear that he was not impressed by Jamaica's development model. Now, mind you, it didn't mean that some of what we were doing was not copied by Singapore. I had the opportunity to speak with one of our industrialists who decided to do business in Singapore in the 80s. And he said when he went to Singapore, he was met by, it's kind of like you describe him as a business chaperone. They, they designed their investment promotion in, in such a way that you are assigned an agent to work with you. And he said when he went to establish the factory, met the agent, the agent took him to the location and said, this is the space where your factory will be located. Of course, this is what you call a plug and play model. You go and your factory is there, your electricity is connected, your water is connected, and your labor force is there waiting for you. That's the level of organization. But the form that he filled out was the exact form that he filled out in Jamaica with our investment promotion agency. And he, he queried it, where did you get this form? And he discovered it was taken from Jamaica. I wanted to see the, the, the profundity of the point I'm making. We are good at some things. We're good at administration. We need to get better at implementation. We're good at making the policy and documenting it and getting trapped in bureaucracy. But what really mattered was that our Jamaican entrepreneur was able to turn up and turn the keys to his factory. In Jamaica, he would have had to fill out that form 20 times. That is what Mr. Siaga wanted to change. But it got trapped into narrow politics. So, Mr. Siaga realized that the, the economy that we had was not fit for growth. I'm going to step a little bit further in history. The idea of heart is not original. It stood on the shoulders of Norman Manley. In the 1950s, Norman Manley also recognized that our youth were untrained. And he established two youth training camps, Chester Vale and Cobbler. I don't know how many of you are aware of that. In an attempt to get our human resources trained up to speed, for varying reasons, it didn't work. Mr. Siaga, seeking to fulfill the same objective, decided that he would, one, not just create a residential training camp where you go and learn one skill and you stay there for a year, but to create training institutions with multiple skills, but also focusing on the development of attitudes and creating a bridge 
to the world of work, to be aligned with the industry, and to dedicate the finances to it by the hard contributions, thereby creating a well-structured vocational training system, which is now a critical institution of Jamaica. But there were other policies as well that had good intentions but were not properly thought out, were not properly researched, where the thinkers and dreamers and visionaries didn't take the time to research it properly. They didn't do like what Edward Siaga do have me up late at night going through the survey of, e of, of the, what is called the ESSJ, the Economic and Social Survey of Jamaica. Looking at the numbers, seeing the trend, making the connections to come out with policies that work. So, in the 70s, the intention of the government to create employment was good. Good, no one could quarrel with that, and government became the chief instrument of employment. And if you look at the statistics during that period of time, you will see employment increasing. But by the time 1980 would come around, going through oil price increase, and then a fallout in commodity prices, particularly for bauxite. How was government going to be able to maintain the employment that it created in the public sector? The policy in the 50s, in the 60s, and in the 70s for industrialization was about giving incentives. And many of the factories that we had attracted into Jamaica was done because we gave fiscal incentives, meaning that we gave up taxation and revenues in order to get factories, believing that these factories would create jobs. It didn't work. And so the government, in trying to compensate and with democratic socialism as their guiding principle, sought to create jobs in the public sector, which could not be financed. So by 1980, Edward Siaga had to contemplate a total restructuring of the Jamaican economy. And that restructuring would have been well along the lines of the gentleman that you mentioned. The introduction of policies that would deregulate, remove controls, right-size public institutions, but of course, it got caught in the politics of the time. Those who were the opinion leaders, those who were the intellectuals at the time, those who were the academics and the professors who could have given the average man a better understanding of what needed to happen, tied up the necessary structural adjustment in political connotations. And for many years, we vacillated in policy. What was the right policy? What was the right thing to do? Hart, however, 
when taken within the context of a total structural readjustment of Jamaica and the Jamaican economy would be an example of one of his policies that did not get caught in the narrow politics of the time. Because the truth be told, Hart was continued and supported through all administrations that have come. There might have been minor policy changes, but Hart continues to be acknowledged as a very important institution in the architecture of Jamaica. So as I close my presentation on Edward Siaga and the formation of Hart, I trust that you have maybe a deeper understanding, more clarity as to the history, where we're coming from, and why it is that things are structured the way they are today. The objective of this administration is to create policies that will last, policies that will rise above narrow political agendas. And uh, I take my lead from Edward Siaga in being very well researched and thorough about the development of policy and more than anything else to be practical and realistic. If there is no other description of Edward Siaga, yes, he was a dreamer. Yes, he was a visionary, but he was also a very practical man. And therefore, he got things done. And if there's one thing you will say about this administration, we get things done. God bless you and thank you. Could you keep the applause going? Please keep the applause going. Author, hotelier, politician, statesman, scholar, cricketer, a visionary, pragmatic in his approaches. Our Prime Minister has given us, he has presented a brilliant account of the life and legacy of the Honorable Edward George Siaga. We have learned that he resided in Buxton and Salt Lane. Who knew that before? You come to class today. And that this, among other things, gave him the experiential growth to put policy into action. I hope you are taking notes. We also learned that he stepped into electoral politics when? When did he step into electoral politics? 1962 and spent how many years of his life in public service? Were the bright students? 45 years. He was Minister of Development and Welfare, Minister of Finance, Prime Minister, and at some point, leader of the opposition. An individual who had an exceptional work ethic, disciplined and thoroughly researched, high-level thinker who paid attention to detail. We're getting the exam, you know, just doing the summary. These are the characteristics of an exceptional human being, and the staff members and stakeholders of Heart Trust are privileged to have had such a founder and to know that after conceptualizing and creating so many organizations, the Heart Trust was the closest to his heart. Indeed, the Honorable Edward Siaga understood that the single most important investment any government can make is an investment in its human development. This is not just an intuitive truth, my classmates. Research across several economies affirm it. The Heart Trust, unlike any other organization, carries a mandate to re-energize Jamaican industries and enterprises. And Prime Minister, we can promise you that we understand that mandate very much. We understand the importance of skilled labor for economic growth 
And indeed, we are not just an institution, Prime Minister. We are the heartbeat of the nation. Can we get a round of applause for our Honorable Prime Minister's account of the life and legacy of our founder? And at this time, before we get into the questions and answers, because when you come to school, when you get a lecture, then of course you're going to have questions. And we're going to hear from all the bright students, and we're going to hear from the ones that were not listening so much, right? But before we do that, we really have to thank our Prime Minister in a very special way. And so I know the individuals who are close to the Prime Minister's heart, you know, the trainees at Heart Trust. And so at this time, Mr. Kevin Hall, trainee of the Amber Heart Institute of Coding. Are we seeing Mr. Kevin Hall coming up at this time, trainee at the Amber Heart Institute of Coding, will be making a presentation to our Prime Minister. Could you welcome him, please? Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I am indeed honored to present this token of our appreciation to the most honorable Andrew Holness, our keynote speaker for addressing us on the life and legacy of the most honorable Edward Siago, who has contributed to Jamaica, including the Heart NSTA Trust, um, I am indeed grateful that I, myself, has benefited from this prestigious and noble organization. And so I'd like to thank the most honorable Andrew Holness, our Prime Minister, for this. Thank you, sir. It's a goodie bag, including a cup with the heart 40th anniversary. Don't, don't worry, I'll just yes. take this as well. Okay. <laughs> An umbrella for the rain. <laughs> and this very beautiful artwork from one of our trainees, I believe. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, you know, anything we give must be produced by heart, you know. You know, we're going to be seeing Prime Minister in very short order. So much more made in Jamaica. So that's what we're working towards. Made in Jamaica. So we're manufacturers, we're producers. And that's what we're pushing at the Heart Trust. And I'm telling you that bench is solid. Very much solid. From the Heart College of construction all right hard college of construction we have our own construction college we understood the vision of the honorable edward siaga and we're very very clear about that of our honorable prime minister and so at this time we're going to have some questions because i'm um, prime minister all the bright people they submitted their questions and if you have more we are not going to take long because we, the time is, is far spent. But they want to hear from you, Prime Minister. They said, um, I'm getting this one. There is no name attached to this one. It says, Mr. Prime Minister, please share with us your most profound memory of Mr. Siaga that impacts your vision for Jamaica. So 
over to you, Prime Minister. Well, I, I came to work with Mr. Serga when I was in my early 20s. I just graduated from the University of the West Indies. I had actually met him while I was a student. And uh, he laid hands on me at that point in time, and he, he gave me a, a folder, a portfolio, of uh, uh, subjects that he wanted me to research and to give him uh, comments and opinions on. So he, he engaged me while I was at the University of the West Indies. And so I, I have many profound experiences with him. But I want to share this one with you, which I've said publicly before. When I became Prime Minister the first time around, he invited me to his home and he sat me down and we were having a long conversation about the party, what the party means, what are our uh, core principles and our philosophy. And then, you know, the conversation entered upon uh, Bustamante. And he said that when he became leader of the Jamaica Labour Party, Bustamante called him to his home and said, Siaga, whatever you do, don't forget the poor. And he held on to my hands and he said the same thing. Andrew, whatever you do, don't forget the poor. It's profound and it's impactful on me because there is a raging debate in Jamaica. Sometimes it goes quiet, sometimes it becomes a part of the political platform. Who cares about the poor? And how do you care about the poor? Of course, we will all remember his famous practical saying, it takes cash to care. True word. And him saying this, don't forget the poor, and the caricature of the Jamaica Labour Party as being the party of business, of being the party of economics, sometimes in the minds of Jamaicans may be conflicting. But it is important, and his statement was really a summary of what the Jamaica Labour Party is, just that it is the party of the working class. It is the party of labor as the critical factor of production in any society, in any economy. It is about the development of people, the development of the workforce, ensuring that Jamaicans can fulfill themselves through their own effort and gain reward and independence from that effort. It's about uplifting the people of the country through good policies, by empowering them through work, through their labor. And that is how we give people their independence. That's what independence means. It's not only a political construct. It is also an economic construct. And it is summed up by Bustamante as don't forget the poor. In all the policy pursuits that you have, in all the grand ideas that you have, ensure that the core of those policies bring along the poor and the most vulnerable in the society. And we have never forgotten that. Brilliant, brilliant response, uh, our Honorable Prime Minister. We have a question here, and we're not going to take much more because we do have a lot, but the Prime Minister would have said much, and much of what he would have said would have answered these questions. 
But here we have one that's asking, do you think that the introduction or inclusion of TVET at the primary level of education would positively impact the probability of Jamaica producing a more competent labor force by reducing the number of unskilled and disengaged youth. What are your thoughts of moving TVET to the primary level? Now you have opened the door for me to speak about education. So as I had said, the formation of heart was primarily as a remedial tool. It was as a, to create a second chance because of the failure of the secondary education system in creating that level of workforce that could be easily absorbed into the economy. I think we have to rethink the model. Heart today is not a remedial entity. No, uh, Heart stands representing a type of education that runs in parallel to the traditional form of education. But we should not seek to create a dichotomy in education because all individuals need to be exposed to the entirety of the spectrum of education. It is at a later stage that you specialize. But in the primary levels and secondary levels, you need to have wide exposure because it is at that point that you need to have this diversity, that you can truly have choice, that you can truly discover your skills and aptitude and competences. Some people may be academically oriented. Some people may be tactile in how they learn. Some people are creative. And some people are a mixture. But as society progress, the level of skills that you need to have to function increases. So 50 years ago, it was satisfactory that you could read and write. You could function in the society. And you'd be considered literate. You're not considered literate today if you are not computer literate. You shouldn't go to the ATM and you can't use the interface. But it is also the case that in today's world, industry has specific standards. So it was fine when you were a tailor and you can sew the pants anyway. Now today, you know, making garments is a highly sophisticated endeavor. You have designers, you have people who specialize in, in the materials, you have people who specialize in the colors and in the dyeing of the fabric. It, it's, it's such a detailed science. And it is not just theoretical science, it's how it is applied. And the jobs are divided down into minute functions. And you need to have competences in these functions. We need technical people then. And so they need to be trained coming up from the primary level to have these technical competences in addition to their academic competences. But they also need to have an, a good and positive posture and attitude towards work. And the education system has to instill that. And that's what a large part of Hart's responsibility. So yes, we must mainstream TVET as we are now seeking to mainstream STEM in our education system to ensure that we produce a Jamaican that has the socio-emotional 
and technical competence to survive in this world of the fourth industrial revolution. Heart has such a critical role to play in that. Thank you, Prime Minister. And one last question. Do you think that it is now critical for government to enact additional legislations that will, en will enable HART to be the TVET driver in a more deliberate manner? That is, is there any thought to a policy being put in place to ensure employers employ graduates from HART? Thank you. It's a tricky question. Uh, in our society, we can't compel private enterprise to hire from any particular institution. Uh, there, there is uh, that you know, guaranteed freedom. And that's why private enterprise will want to come to Jamaica, because they, they do have freedom. Our job is to support the market, to make the market for trained labor. So whether they are trained at Hart or they are trained somewhere else, Hart's role is to set the standard so that there is a high standard of work, uh, of skills rather, in the society. And you can choose from that, right? So Hart is the regulator, and Hart should encourage competition in training. And it is out of that that you get the highest standards being met and um, delivered to industry. In terms of legislation, I think we have gone and changed the, the legislation already. Legislation is a long and tedious process, but you, you already have legislation which gives you a wide space to work. So what we really need now are policies and the implementation of those policies. Uh, if there is one thing that I would want to see in legislation, which we are not there yet as a society, is the full introduction of a system of apprenticeship. Uh, I, I think that's absolutely important if we're going to leapfrog in where we are in terms of skills. Uh, that's absolutely, uh, without question, absolutely important. Uh, and then, you know, I've always been a big advocate for national service. Uh, and I think we, we need a system of you know, compulsory national service. Uh, when I see our youngsters being, being dragged off into gangs and being recruited for nefarious activities, when there is so much that we could put them in groups to do in the national interest, in their own interest, that could transform our culture. I, I think that is something that we should really be considering, it's something that I am considering. But the question is, is the society ready? You know, there, there needs to be more debate on this. And do we have the budget for it? But I think it is critically important uh, that we now you know, move to the next step of ensuring that we have a system of apprenticeship, a fully articulated and uh, well-implemented system of apprenticeship. And as the society progress, we can establish a system of national service. But in closing, and you said it's the last question, uh, on my way here, uh, one of our major hoteliers sent me a note to say, Prime Minister, the winter season is coming up, and uh, we need labor. We need people. Jamaica has a good problem now. We have low levels of unemployment. We also continue to export talent. And the availability of labor is now a constraint on our growth horizon. It is not that I'm making a case for the importation of labor, which when I make these comments, you know, you, you have to go over and over and over to explain because people immediately run off with all kinds of things you didn't say. The case that has to be made 
is that there still are approximately three to 400,000 Jamaicans who's, who are within the age group of the labor force, but whose training and education is such that they cannot articulate into the work world. And there are still Jamaicans who simply are not participating in the labor force. They have no need, no interest to participate because maybe the wages don't attract them. So there is still work to be done by heart to get into the inner cities, to get into the rural areas, to get those young people, bring them into programs, provide them with stipends, change their mindset and their outlook, and bring them into the labor force there is work there for them because the economy is growing if we don't do it it will affect our growth in the next five years the bpo sector today could absorb easily another 20,000 jamaicans the logistics industry is showing great signs of growth and could easily absorb between five and ten thousand more Jamaicans. The hotel industry is saying we need more people. The quick service industry is saying we need more people. But it's not just those industries. If we had data scientists here, the knowledge industry would be huge. But where are they? They are in scamming. They are in gangs. They are committing drive-bys. They are boring holes in their hand middle. Wasted youth. A dead weight loss to the society. A Jamaican who will never contribute to the development of the country or the whole human race. So much potential wasted. Heart still has a very important role to play. Thank you so much for that, Honorable Prime Minister. And I could see the excitement on the Senior Director of, of Entrepreneurship's face. When we spoke about apprenticeship, I saw Mr. Marlon Johnson getting excited. And as soon as the Prime Minister spoke about what he expects of heart, I saw our Chief Strategist, Mrs. Christine Gittens, writing away, because we are people of action. We are going back, and tomorrow morning, when we call the meeting, Mrs. Gittens, we are writing these things into the plan because we move into action at heart. That's who our founder was. That's who our prime minister is. That's who our chairman is. And so that's who we are. At this time, we're going to be hearing from Mrs. Julia Smiley Green, and I really want to commend us. It's just seven minutes after six. And we started a little late, and we're supposed to end at 6, so we're doing well. So Mrs. Julia Smiley Green, our Director of Marketing and Communications, will be moving the vote of thanks. And I'm asking the entertainment team to get ready, because as soon as she does that, we'll be taking the entertainment. Mrs. Julia Smiley Green, please welcome her. Thank you to our moderator and managing director, Dr. Tanisha Ingleton, the most honorable Andrew Holness, Prime Minister, Honorable Favel Williams, Minister of Education and Youth in her absence, members of the Houses of Parliament, Senator the Honorable Thomas Tavares Finson, President of the Senate, Professor the Honorable Alvin Wint, Chairman of the Board of Directors at the Heart NSTA Trust, Professor Colin Giles, President and President and Faculty and Staff of UTEC, Heads of Public and Private Sector Bodies, Representatives from Academia, 
staff members of the Heart and Estate Trust, students, media representatives, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. On behalf of the Heart and Estate Trust, I would like to extend a sincere thanks to all of you who attended and were involved in making today's event a success. Our Managing Director, Dr. Ingleton, we thank you for your warm welcome and introduction, as well as for the grace with which you guided us through the proceedings. Professor the Honorable Alvin Winter, Chairman, we thank you, sir, for sharing with us riveting and thought-provoking remarks that, as usual, were inter was interspersed with historical lessons. The Honorable Favel Williams, Minister of Education, we want to thank her as well in her absence for her warm and insightful remarks and for acknowledging the importance of heart in transforming the lives of Jamaicans. Prime Minister, the Most Honorable Andrew Holness, we thank you, sir, for agreeing to be our keynote speaker for today and for sharing your in-depth knowledge and insights into the life and legacy of the former Prime Minister, the Most Honorable Edward Siago. Your delivery was exciting and enlightening. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. We're indebted to all of you for taking time to be a part of today's proceedings. I also want to thank our members of staff who supported me in planning this event for all the work that went in, for the vision, the interest, and for all the effort that has culminated in a fruitful and productive event that I'm sure will have a lasting impression on all of you who attended. I want to also thank the staff of the Protocol and Communications Unit at the Office of the Prime Minister who rallied to our assistance and provided guidance to ensure that we had a near flawlessly executed event. And finally, ladies and gentlemen, I must also acknowledge the Jamaica Information Service and the members of the media, members of other media houses, for covering and capturing the event and ensuring that we were able to live stream this event to persons who could not be physically gathered here with us. Thanks to UTEC for accommodating us in this venue and all our suppliers and providers who contributed to making our event a success, I want to say thank you. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for taking the time out of your very busy schedules to be with us this afternoon into this evening and as I take my leave of the lectern, I say thanks, thanks, thanks. Thank you. And could we get, thank you so much, Mrs. Smiley Green. Just so much work, so much effort. Truly impressed with your work um, over this 40th anniversary celebration. Give her a round of applause, please. And you see the beauty coming in. And of course, this is the Tivoli Dance Troupe. And we couldn't get any other entertainment other than the Tivoli Dance Troupe from his former constituency doing what he loved the most, the performance of Jamaican culture. Could you welcome them again? <laughs> Tivoli Dance Troupe. Over to you. Thank you.
They deserve way more than that, man. Come on, come on. Tivoli dance troupe, such talent, such beauty, such agility. We are so pleased to have them with us tonight. And so we have come to the end of our program. We do have refreshments. Refreshments will be served, but I'm asking that we allow the most honorable prime minister to take his leave before we have any movements. And so I'm going to direct that at this time, our most honorable prime minister and our professor, Professor Alvin Wind, will take their leave from the podium. And then right after that, the shutters to my left will be opened and refreshment will be served just outside from there. So again, let's just give a rousing round of applause for a brilliant public lecture on the life and the legacy of the Honorable Edward Philip George Sayaga. Thank you. Thank you.
And so audience, at this time, you are free to participate in the refreshment and in the meeting and greeting. And please make sure that tomorrow, not tomorrow, on Sunday, you grab a copy of the Gleaner and the Observer. You have to buy the both of them. You might never know what you will see in them on Sunday. You cannot afford to not buy a hard copy, not a soft version, not the internet version, a real life copy of the Gleaner and the Observer on Sunday. Goodies may await, you may win an award. You never know, there are prizes and surprises. Grab a copy on Sunday, thank you. So the shutters are opening up and you can enjoy, enjoy the refreshment from the Heart Trust. Thank you again and have a great evening.